to you. What does that mean? Guys, y'all did a great, and ladies, y'all did a great job this morning. Well, I heard one amen. I thought they did a great job. How about you, church? Now, um, we're here today because we want to worship God. We're here today because we want to love our Savior. But what does it mean when we say love our Savior? See, we're going to be looking at this in a little bit of a deeper aspect than what we would normally in a different way. Because for us to love ourselves and for us to love our neighbor... We will never truly know what that love is until we first love God. So if you love God, you can love yourself. And if you love yourself, you can love your neighbor. But without God, at best, you can deal with yourself. And at the very best, you can put up with your neighbor. Because let's face it, some of us have probably had some rough neighbors in our life. Have we not? That's a lot more amens than I thought I'd have to hear this morning. So before we go any further, I want everyone, if you've got someone to your right, turn to your right and say, good morning, neighbor. Now turn to your left and say, good morning, there you go, get into it, yeah. Now turn to your left and say, good morning, neighbor. See, here's the thing about neighbors. It's not the person that lives beside you. The neighbor that the Bible refers to is the neighbor that God puts in front of you. It's everyone in your life beside you that you come into contact with. That is your neighbor. Now, we may be looking at it and say, well, Pastor, you just don't know. I've got a neighbor next door that all he does every Friday and Saturday night is they go over there, they have a bonfire, they play loud music, and they get drunk, and they throw their beer cans on my side. Am I supposed to love them? Yes, you are. Well, I don't like what they're doing. I can't sleep at night. I didn't say it would be easy to always love your neighbor. Sometimes it's really, really hard. Sometimes it's your own kin that are your neighbors, your own family that are your neighbors, and you forget how special they are to you as your kin, your brothers and sisters in Christ, until they come in turmoil, until they come into suffering. And then you remember, really, how much they mean to you. But then there are strangers that are neighbors. These strangers that are neighbors, they come into our lives, and we never know. They may be in our life for a neighbor of ten minutes, and you'll never see them again. I want to share with you a story about a neighbor in my life. His name was Gus. See, before I came into full-time ministry, I was at one of my offices in the upstate, and I always had this thing. We didn't pay for people to clean the offices. So when I would go into one of the offices, at the end of the day, I would always go up to the ladies and say, okay, ladies, today, just so you know I'm not being unfair, I'm going to do all the vacuuming, I'm going to do all the cleaning, I'm going to do all the dusting, and I'm going to take the trash out. And I will always do that when I come to your office and work that day on one condition you never tell my wife. And they never did. I'd always let them leave 30 minutes early. Because I didn't want them seeing me do it. I didn't have a problem with them seeing me. But I just liked doing it on my own. So this particular day in the upstate, I was taking out the trash. It was a rather windy day. It was a very cold, cold day. It was loomy. And it was cloudy. And it wasn't raining, but it was that wetness feeling. So I go out there to the dumpster, and imagine this. There's a dumpster about the size of this organ here, and then there are uh, shrubbery all the way over it, 10 feet high. You can't see it. And I go to it, and I throw the trash, and as I'm throwing the trash, I hear something behind the dumpster as it lands on the floor of the dumpster. And I was like, okay, there's something behind this dumpster. So just like any other man, I say, hey. What's back there? The gentleman comes out from behind the dumpster and he says, it's okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a mean guy. That's exactly what he said. I'll never forget. I'm not a mean guy. I could tell he, he was very dirty from the top of his head to the bottom. I thought maybe he was homeless and maybe he just didn't know where he was at. I 
had a hundred things go through my mind, and I said, what are you doing back there? He said, well, sir, he said, uh, uh, it's really windy, and he said, I have a ride that picks me up every day because there was a road, a road that went behind the building right here, and the wind was blowing so hard, I could see through the bushes, and I was waiting for my ride to get here to get me home. And I said, what? He said, well, I have two rides. One of my work co-workers picks me up here every morning and drops me off, and then my wife and my two children come and pick me up here, and then they bring me home because I, I don't have a driver's license. I said, okay. And without any hesitation, he wanted to tell me a little bit about his life, and I just stood there for a second, and he said, I, I don't know if you can tell, he said, by the way I speak, he said, I, I'm not a very smart man, and I could not tell, but I said, okay, and he said, I, 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 and then I realized he stuttered, and he said, this is where they pick me up and they take me home, but it's okay, he said, I, 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 I I'm not harmful, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mean. I said, are you okay? He said, yes, sir. He said, I can work now. He said, I, I have a job. I work in a factory and I clean up things. And he said, I'm sorry I'm so dirty. He said, but I can work now and I can take care of my wife and my kids. I said, well, it's okay, buddy. I said, you... You going to be good? He said, yeah, I, I just got cold. I don't have a jacket, but we're going to get me one because I get paid tomorrow. I said, well, why don't you come on inside because it started to rain. And I said, you can look out behind the building in the kitchenette, and there's a window, and when your family gets here, you can walk outside, and I won't leave until they get here. Can I ask you to come inside? Thank, thank you. I was cold. See, I'd never met this neighbor before in my life. And until I heard him speak, I, I didn't know what kind of person he was going to be. But I want you to hear what your pastor was thinking before he ever opened his mouth, before he ever started speaking. Put yourself in my shoes. A man comes from behind a dumpster who is filthy and hunkered over somewhere he probably shouldn't have been. See, I had a hundred things running through my mind, and none of them were correct. I would like to say that I sit on a level higher in my thinking than others, but the truth of the matter is, it's 30-something years ago, I guess... I wasn't no different than anybody else. He was my neighbor. And although all I could offer him was a dry place and a warm place to come in out of the wind, it was an invitation I was happy to give. His name was Gus. And I'll never forget Gus. Have we ever made assumptions about our neighbors in life that God had put into contact with us before we ever really knew them and how we could ever really help them? This morning, we're going to be looking in God's Word in Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in verses 25 through 37. Of course, the verses will be on the screen. But I want you to think about what's going through the mind here as Jesus is talking to a brilliant lawyer, apparently, who thought he was just on a different level than everyone else. If you're able, if you're willing, if you would please stand as we read God's word, verses 25. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put to the test, put him to the test, talking to Jesus. Can you imagine someone putting Jesus to the test? I can't imagine saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered the lawyer, You shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and, with your, and your neighbor as yourself. 
And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Let us pray. Father, I ask that as we go further, that we would remember exactly who our true neighbors are in life. Not just the ones that live beside us or work with us and come in contact with us, but the ones you put in contact with us every day. And let us have a heart of compassion. So I pray that this service would show your compassion to us as your sons and daughters come to hear your word. Have it bestowed on their heart, applied to their life, and live it out daily. For in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So what do we see here? It says in verse number 29, But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? This lawyer comes to Jesus, wants to know how to get eternal life, and him being a lawyer and looking at Jesus, tries to pull one over on himself. Well, exactly how do I do this? He's putting God to the test. God will always pass the test. But the answer here, we find it in Matthew 22. See, when we understand, folks, we don't have to do an extensive search in the Bible to find out what's most important to God and what is the greatest commandment ever given by God, specifically Jesus Christ, when he said in Matthew 22, verses 37 and 39, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning of this sermon to now. When you love God, you can love yourself. And when you love yourself the way God intends you to love him, you can love every neighbor that you come into contact with. I've made this statement to my daughters a lot over the years. I'm sure I'll say it again. I absolutely love you with all of my heart. I don't always like you. But I love you right now. I think this isn't part of my sermon, but my daughter Madison, I know she'll be watching later on today. When she was driving the car I'm driving now, she backed that car, the Explorer, we call it, it's white, we call it Dora the Explorer. She backed it into a ravine to where it was literally hanging off. The tires were not touching. She calls me and says, oopsie. And I say, you do realize there's there's got to be something broke here because we had to get someone to come and pull it out. It was an ordeal. And just this past weekend, I went to a wedding with my niece and I was in the car with my wife, I mean with my daughter Madison, and she has a new uh, Toyota 4Runner. And she backs it into a ravine. And I had been waiting almost 12 years for this. Whoopsie. (laughs) It's not funny, Dad. I know. (laughs) It might have broke something. I know. (laughs) You're just enjoying this too much. Yes, I am. And then I remembered she's not only my daughter, she's my neighbor. So she gets out of the rain. She goes, you know, I know exactly what you're thinking. And she goes, I'm just glad it wasn't what it was with your car as it is mine. I said, yeah. And we bring these memories up and we laugh about it, but we think about what it means to love. See, I can love my wife and my children. Folks, I can love you through all your faults because every one of you in here have a fault because I know I have faults. And I can love you through your faults because I can love myself through my faults because I can love God. You've got to understand that through the love of God, we're able to not only love ourselves, but we're also able to love our neighbors. And this sermon makes absolutely no sense to you if you don't understand and grasp this verse in Matthew 22 through 37 and 39. You must love God with all your heart. And if you do not, you will never experience true love as it is meant to be. Because you'll do exactly 
what others will do when you come across Naaman. You'll step aside and you'll look away. Look in verses number 30 and 31, back in Luke. It says, Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now I want you to put this in your mind. They beat him. In other words, he's bruised all up. In the head, in the gut, in the legs, they kicked him, they beat him. They didn't just knock him out like you see on TV. They left him for dead. They stripped him completely naked threw him in the gutter, and they took everything he had. You didn't know if this man was Jew. You didn't know if he was a priest. You didn't know if he was a Levite. You didn't know if he was uh, from any other country, and you didn't know if he was a Samaritan. All you knew was there was a man in the ditch who was left for dead. Now, by chance, a priest, priest meaning a Jew, was going that road, and when he saw him, he passed away, on the other side. A priest, a man of the cloth, a preacher, a pastor, Sunday school teacher, a leader in the church, a deacon. Here we see priest. Sees the man on the side of the road. He can't tell what kind of man he is because he's been beaten to a point that he's bruised. There's nothing around him. And instead of running to this pre this man, the priest looks at him and says, Ew. He sure is dirty, nasty. Uh, probably been in some kind of dumpster somewhere. I ain't going to mess with him. God's people can't do what God's people are called to do. How do we expect others to learn from us what true love is? Romans 13, 10, love does not wrong uh, to a neighbor. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling of the law. I'm going to write a verse down. That's a good one to have. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, therefore love is fulfilling of the law. So we love our neighbors. This priest literally stepped aside, looked away, and walked away. This man could not fend for himself. This man could not take care of himself. This man had no help from himself whatsoever. He was done. Come nightfall, the coyotes were going to get him. And you would think a priest of all would have been willing to help. Folks, there is no avoiding your neighbor when God is your king. Do you hear me? There is no avoiding your neighbor when God is your king. We must be called to have compassion. Look in verses number 32 and 33. And likewise, the Levite, a Jew... When he came to the place and saw him, pass by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Why is it so important? Why couldn't it just see a man came by and looked away? Another man came by and looked away. But here we see a Samaritan comes by and he does not look away. Here a priest, a Jew, comes by. Then a Levite, which is another Jew, comes by. Please know I am not knocking the Jews. But then a Samaritan. Why did God say a Samaritan? Why did Jesus use the Samaritan? If you don't know, Samaritans were sought or thought of by Jews as second class. Because they had taken, when they got conquered, Assyrian wives. And their blood was not pure, as they would see. So they weren't concerned. If you saw a Samaritan coming or if you were going to go to a journey, you would completely, even though it would add three days to go around Samaria, if you went through Samaria as Jesus was when he was going to the well to meet the woman, he decided to go through Samaria, not around. 
but you had to avoid them because the stigma was you didn't have anything to do with a Sumerian. But yet it was a Sumerian that showed compassion. It's a Sumerian with a good heart, kindness, and love that came and knelt down to this man to show him grace and to show him the only love that God can show, which is pure. Folks, we're called to do the same thing. In Colossians 3.12 Put on then a God's chosen one, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. That's the ESV, but I want to read the King James Version. It says, put on therefore as the elect of God, the elect meaning everyone who has accepted God as their Savior, because God has accepted everyone that accepts His Son as their children. The elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. When we take these two scriptures and you look at it, and the ESV says compassionate hearts. It translates compassionate hearts, and the King James Version says bowels of mercy. And people look at that and say, ooh, bowels. You need to understand that in the beginning, when they thought the Spirit dwelled within them, they thought He dwelled in those deepest, wonderful parts of the body, and, and it was the bowels. Later on, we transferred it to the heart. We understand that the Bible is a heart, meaning your soul. And it shows that mercy is going to be given. And people will look at others and say, well, you don't deserve mercy, folks. That's what mercy is. Mercy is something that you give because they don't deserve it. It says it has to come from the deepest parts of our body, meaning the soul. Matthew Henry's commentary says, we are commanded to not only show, but have compassion towards the miserables. Talking about those who are hurting. Bowels of mercy. The tenderest mercies. Those who owe so much to mercy ought to be merciful to all who are proper objects of mercy. We can show mercy because mercy was first shown to us. If it were not for mercy, nobody would be saved. If it were not for mercy, there would be no such thing as grace. If it were not for mercy, there would be no redemption. There would be no church. There would be no pews and you would not be here. And we are called by God to show this exact same mercy to others. In Luke 6.36, it says, be merciful as your father is merciful. This is the reason we show compassion. This is the reason we show mercy. This is the reason that through this we can have kindness and humility and be of meekness of mind and heart to those because we will be patient, talking about long-suffering with those who need it because we go into this world and as Christians we're constantly looking at non-Christians and say they're not living right. I don't like the way they're living. I don't, I don't want to be a part or try to go to them. Folks, we can't expect non-Christians to live like Christians because con-Christians don't know no better. That's the reason we go out into the world and we hide the God's Word in our heart and we show that mercy to them. That's the calling of the church. That's the Great Commission. Now, the Samaritan, he looks at him and he has compassion on him. And he decides to help him. We're sitting there in the kitchen and he's waiting for his ride. And I said, Gus, I said, how long is it going to be? And uh, after about 15 minutes, I asked him this question. He goes, well, they're normally already here. I said, well, do you have a phone? He said, yes, sir. He said, I don't know how to use it. He goes, I've only had it for a week or two. He said, I've only been out of prison for a little while. And, and when I went in, they didn't really have these things. I said, well, can I help you? He said, well, yeah. He said, I know you flip this up, and if I hit this star button right here and hit one, it's supposed to call them. I've never really used it. He goes, they've always been on time. I said, well, do you mind if I hit the star button and call them? 
And he said, if you know how to use it, I said, I might know. So I hit it, and it starts ringing. I hand it back to him, and he talks to his wife, and she says they're sorry. They're running a little late. Something had happened to the car, and they'd be there as soon as they could. And he said, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'll go back outside and stand behind the dumpster. He said, can you give me a trash bag so I can put over me? I said, well, how far do you live? He said, I, I don't live that far, probably 15 minutes. I said, well, if they're not here in five or ten minutes, we'll call them back and I'll just take you home myself. How does that sound? He said, well, you don't have to do that. He said, that's your really nice car out there, ain't it? And I said, well, not really. It's the company, so we won't worry about it. He said, well, I kind of stink. I said, I don't smell a thing. I don't know why, but I instantly like Gus. Let me tell you why I like Gus. He didn't try to act like something he's what, what he didn't try to act like something he wasn't. He didn't try to put on any airs. Gus was just Gus. I'm, I'm not a smart man. I, I'm not a rich man. I, 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 don't, I don't pretend to be. I could just see that in his voice. And somewhere in the conversation, he asked me what I did there. And I said, well, I run the companies. And I said, but on the other hand, I said, I, I'm a, a bivocational pastor at a church in Powdersville. And he said, well, that's good. I said, do you know Jesus? I was so hoping he said yes. No, sir, I, I don't know Jesus. I've heard of Jesus, but I don't know no Jesus. And see, I know where y'all think this is going. Because I wanted to tell him about Jesus, but he said it's so hard to understand. He said, I, I, I just know there's, he says, there's got to be something out there better than I am. He said, because they can't all be, and please you, uh, don't hold me to this, they can't all be as stupid as me, right? And I said, Gus, you're not stupid. I said, you got a job. You're taking care of your family. I said, you're doing it, man. I said, you ever go to church? He said, we only got the one car. And he said, we can't really afford, and my family ain't going to go to church. I said, do you want to go to church? And the minute I asked him, I was thinking, how in the world are you going to drive an hour to pick him up, drive an hour back to get him back to church? Well, he said, I would like to go. Stuck. Now I got to bring him to church. And I like Gus. But if you know anything about the upstate, easily to Greer on 85, that's an hour and a half drive on Sundays. Not because people were going to church, but because people were going to eat. And I said, Well, what if I find a church here local for you that has a bus ministry? Would you be willing to go then? He said, well, if they'll come pick me up. He goes, well, they have to wake my family up. I said, no, sir, they won't have to wake your family up. So I made a few phone calls. I found a church, literally just 10 minutes from his house. We rode to the church. The pastor wasn't there, but somebody else was there. I can't remember the gentleman's name. And I introduced him to Gus, and he kind of looked at Gus. And I said, I want you to know that Gus is dirty from work, but he would like to come to church. And y'all have a bus ministry here. Would you be willing to come pick him up? And he said, yeah. He goes, we'll be coming, willing to come. If he'll give us an address, he has to be outside five minutes before we get there. And we can't guarantee you when you're going to get home. I said, Gus, are you willing to come? He said, if they'll come pick me up, I'll come. And he said, I'll put on a clean shirt and I'll even bathe. I didn't think that that was in question, but hey. So then I took him home. It's a very modest apartment. I wouldn't want to live there. But he was so proud. He said, this is my home. I've never had a home since I've been in prison. My wife and my children are with me now. And he was so proud. And I was so humiliated in my heart. Because where he was living, he thought was a mansion. And I had been to third world countries where they lived in huts that were nicer than that apartment. There was a lot of soul searching that night for your pastor. But then I started thinking, hey, he might go to church. 
See, this good Samaritan, what does it say? He had compassion on him. If you go on, it says, He went to him and bound up his wounds. It says, Pouring oil and wine, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out the two denarii, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Even though he was a Samaritan, this innkeeper must have known this man and must have known he was good for his promise. And he says he put him on his own animal, took him to the inn. And the Samaritan took care of his wound and put him in a bed and told the innkeeper, I've got to go, but whatever you need, you take care of this man and I will pay whatever it takes. He went the extra mile. And he didn't care what it cost him. He knew it was something that had to be done. Folks, we as God's children should be willing to go the extra mile. We should be willing to do as God calls us to do. The Samaritan not only helped, but when he went the extra mile, as Matthew 5, 41 says, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. That's what we're called to do. I don't know if you know this or not, but because tax revenues did not cover all the Romans' army's needs in that day, Soldiers could re, uh, requisition, requi I can't even say the word, requisition what they require. Romans could legally demand local inhabitants to provide forced labor if they wanted. We see this in Matthew 27, 32, when the centurion went to Siren and Simon by name, they compelled him to carry the cross for Jesus. If they were coming from a battle and a Roman soldier saw Someone on the side of the road, he could literally take off all his heavy attire, his sword, his shield, and anything else that he wanted and put them and said, you've got to carry this one mile for me. And Jesus said, don't carry it one. He said, carry it two. And when they ask why you're carrying it two, you tell them, because I want to show you the love of Christ. This man did not have to help this other one on the side of the road, but yet he felt compelled to help this man that could not help himself. So what does this mean? You never know what the end result's going to be. See, we don't know if the Samaritan ever came back to check on this man or if this man got better and he left and he ever thanked the Samaritan. You, you just don't know. But you do because God calls you to do. You do because when God puts gusses in your life, you make sure that you show them the love of Christ. Because if you don't, who else will? Six or seven months go by and I'm in the office. My car is out front. And at the end of the day, a man and his wife and two children walk in. His hair's clean this time. His clothes are worn, but they're not dirty. I'd like to speak to the man who runs this place. I know he's here because his car's out there. We've been waiting for a while to see when his car would be. I didn't go to the offices because there were so many. But they have been driving by every day to see when my car would be out there. So when my car was there, they come by. And they call me and I come up front and I said, Gus, Gus, is that you? He said, yes, sir. He said, I got cleaned up for you. It's still worn out, but they're clean. You know, the jeans had the slick spark. Don't, don't matter how much you, my mama would call those my playing, my playing jeans when I was growing up. His wife was there, very meek. Two teenage kids standing there like teenage kids do. reaches his hand out, and he says, I wanted to thank you. And I said, Gus, you don't have to thank me for nothing. I just gave you a cup of water and get you out of the rain. No, no, no. We went to church, and then the wife reached out her hand and grabbed my hand, and, and, and she started going, and I made my kids go. He might not have been a smart man, but he understood what it meant to lead a family. I, I just wanted you to know that we all go to church now. And I said, well, Gus... That's, that's great. I, I want you to know that we, we've all been baptized because we saved. She 
It's one of the greatest days of my life. <laughs> because I judged the man by the way he looked. And God loved the man because of the heart that was inside. I have never done that again in my life. And God had to teach me that 30 years ago because if he hadn't, I would have never been in this pulpit today. Every one of us have gusses in our life. Every one of us have an opportunity to share. And I wanted to tell a man about Jesus. And although I showed a little bit of compassion, I gave a little bit of warmth. I gave a small cup of bottled water. The reward was a family that will now live in heaven for all eternity. Folks, that is not an amen for the pastor of Bart glory of God who are the gusses and neighbors in your life verses 36 and 37 which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man among who fell among the robbers he said the one who showed him mercy and Jesus said to him you go and do likewise church we're called to show mercy so here we are along with the lawyer trying to figure out whom we're supposed to love. And Jesus turns the question around on this lawyer. Look at this man who acts in mercy. So we need to stop asking, who is my neighbor? Neighbor, There are deeper questions to ponder. And I love this line. When you're trying to establish, is this my neighbor? The decisive issue of love remains. What kind of person and neighbor will I be? So who are you? That's the question. How will you treat Gus's in your life? Who's your neighbors? Is it the ones living beside you where you live? Is it the ones sitting beside you now? Or is it every lost soul or saved soul that needs compassion? That God puts in your let us pray, Father. We come to you today. Through this simple parable. We hope that you are encouraged by today's message. Please be sure to like and follow us on Facebook at FBC Barnwell for important updates. To give online, please visit our website at www.fbcbarnwell.org. Tithes and offerings are also accepted in the church office located at 161 Allen Street or via the Postal Service by mailing your donation to the address on the screen. Remember this week to keep putting God first in all that you do.